Okay, ladies and gentlemen, why don't we get started? Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco, and I have the privilege of directing the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Center. Uh, and it is our pleasure to be co-hosting today's event with the World Resources Institute, a discussion I'm very much looking forward to, a new book, Greening Aid, Understanding the Environmental Impact of Development Assistance. Uh, for those of you who may be new to the Wilson Center, allow me just one quick word. Uh, this is actually the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson, so as our only president who had a PhD, uh, Congress saw fit to uh, memorialize him with a living memorial where the worlds of scholarship can come together where the worlds of practice, which I think today's session personifies exactly trying to do that. Um, and we're a nonpartisan, non-advocacy institute that's directed by former Congressman Lee Hamilton. Um, the Environmental Change and Security Program within that, one of our functional programs, uh, it's a 14-year-old program that tries to bring together the worlds of environment, health, population, development, foreign and security policy. So a lot of the issues that we'll touch on today are certainly relevant to that. Um, as I mentioned, it is really our great pleasure to be uh, working with the World Resources Institute. And I'll introduce Manish Bapta uh, in just a moment to kick us off with the discussion uh, and uh, have our speakers uh, present the book. Um, I will mention we're also webcasting the session uh, live, and so those of you who are watching online, the PowerPoint that uh, we will use today is on the website. Probably best to, to watch it by opening it up there rather than trying to look over our speaker's shoulder on the broadcast. And also, if you'd like to email a question, the email address is there to do that, and one of my colleagues will bring that up to me for the Q&A time. For that purposes, then, folks here in the room, when we do come to that period, if I could ask you to wait for one of my colleagues to bring your microphone, identify yourself, and use the microphone so the folks online can hear your question as well. Um, so we have uh, three, the three authors uh, of this book to present it. Uh, Brad Parks is a research fellow at the College of William and Mary's Institute for the Theory and Practice of International Relations. Uh, he's also associate director in the Department of Policy and International Relations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation here in town. Uh, Timmons Roberts is the Chancellor Professor of Sociology and Acting Director of the Environmental Science and Policy Program at the College of William and Mary. And Mike Turney is, the, uh, is an Associate Professor in Government and Director of the International Relations Program at the College of William and Mary. And so as somebody who comes out of a political science IR background who studied environmental politics, it's terrific to have that whole continuum reflected. And so it, it's um, with great anticipation we're, we're um, here to for them to present their new book. And I should mention, our bookseller is just a bit late. They probably didn't want to go out in the heat. But when we're done, you will be able to buy the book out front. Uh, and then finally, Bob Goodland, who has been kind enough to come and serve as a discussant today. I think, as many of you know, Bob uh, was really one of the people within the World Bank really pushing uh, environmental issues and getting a, a sector uh, to take these issues seriously in ways that they didn't always want to. And so it's terrific. Uh, that he's agreed to come and, and make a few comments and kick us off in our discussion. So I'd like to turn the floor over to Manish now to give a, a few comments from the World Resources Institute perspective. I know they've been uh, intimately involved in this effort from the very beginning, so it's terrific to have him here at the center today. So please. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction, uh, and welcome to today's uh, book seminar on greening aid. Uh, the topic of today's talk is one that's of particular interest to me, as I've worked on both sides of, these, of this issue. Uh, about 15 years ago, I started my career at the World Bank, uh, actually with Robert Goodland, and we uh, spent a lot of time both designing and implementing environmental projects, uh, both both what we would call kind of dirty aid as well as green aid. Um, but about seven, eight years ago, actually about five, six years ago, I left, and I actually have since been working with nonprofits looking at how to analyze, advocate for better environmental aid. So an issue that's very close to my heart. Uh, my, my only, my single only complaint about this book is I wish I had it 10 years ago. But I'm still uh, particularly pleased to be here to see whether at least what I've been arguing over those 10 years is indeed substantiated by the evidence. Um, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about WRI. Uh, we're a research institute, as many of you know, focused on global environmental trends. Uh, periodically, we take, uh, we take time, we kind of step back to identify and analyze those trends, those meta-trends 
that we feel are most important in shaping kind of the world in which we live. And we do this for a couple of reasons, to make sure that we're working on the right issues and to make sure that we're really effective in what we choose to work on. And the reason I raise this is I think our most recent set of metatrends that we've identified really point to the relevance, the timeliness, the importance uh, of this particular book. And what I'd like to do is take just a couple of minutes and share with you some of the metatrends, uh, a set of these metatrends that we feel are most important today. And I'm going to connect that to why I think, uh, why I think you all should read this book. Um, let me start with the environment. Uh, given the audience, uh, I think we all can appreciate that a lot of the environmental trends that we most deeply care about um, are worsening, and many at an accelerating, uh, accelerating rate. If you look at the latest climate science, uh, it's particularly troubling. Even the most pessimistic scenarios of the IPCC have proven to be more optimistic than reality has shown. Uh, atmospheric carbon has surpassed 385 parts per million, and some of the leading climatologists are arguing that 350 is the target that we should be shooting for. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, from a few years ago concluded that 15 out of 24 of the global ecosystems in the world today are in a state of decline. 8% of tropical forests during the 1990s were lost. 75% of marine fisheries are either uh, fished at or over capacity. So the, the, the sad truth of the matter is that despite 30 years of quite, quite committed kind of focus on trying to address environmental issues, many of the things that we care most deeply about are considerably worse today than they were uh, when the modern environmental movement began. And I think that that gives us reason to kind of pause, to kind of think about what we're doing right, but also to, to think a bit about what we need to be doing differently. Um, looking beyond the environment, uh, there's a number of other trends that I think are really quite important and that help kind of inform, uh, kind of set the stage for the book. The shift from a unipolar to a multipolar world. Uh, centers of economic and political power are shifting and are diversifying. Decisions are being taken not only now in Washington, D.C., or New York, or in London, but increasingly in Delhi, in Beijing, in Moscow. Global economic output has expanded dramatically over the past decade, but globalization is creating both winners and losers. And we're seeing inequality increasing kind of both between and within countries. 2007 marked the year when more people lived in cities than in the country. We're increasingly an urban society. Uh, and this has profound implications, not only on our collective environmental footprint, but how we as a society connect to, relate to kind of the environment. In 20 years, over half of the global middle class will be in China or in India. The voices and values of these people and the choices that they make as, as voters, as shareholders, as consumers, will be crucial to the global environment. The Asian middle class are becoming the new environmental stewards for the planet. Development assistance, and finally development assistance, undergoing incredible transformation. Traditional donors are splintering into many specialized agencies. Large new bilaterals have emerged from the south with their own somewhat distinct approaches to development cooperation. Private philanthropy is surging, and some of the recent estimates show that the donation or the value of private philanthropy has now equaled or exceeded official aid. So th this new reality of development aid is one of fragmentation, it's one of volatility, and it has pretty profound implications for the future of environmental aid. So, so with this kind of backdrop, I want to give you... Uh, three reasons why I think, uh, think you all should read this book. Uh, first, the topic. It's, it's, it's really relevant. Um, given the urgency, the scale of the global environmental challenges we're facing today, if, if we're going to have any chance at halting and reversing these troubling environmental trends, environmental aid has a crucial role to play, not only in promoting sustainability in developing countries, but also in constructively engaging developing countries to participate 
in international environmental agreements. The challenge that we face are immense, and the book focuses on an important part of the solution, what the appropriate role, what the appropriate contribution of environmental aid should be. A second reason you should read this study is, is the sheer analytical rigor. Um, the, the authors have to be tremendously commended. Uh, a very systematic, a very thorough analysis that they did. Uh, really commend them for doing that hard slog. The project level aid database that they created is phenomenal. They, they, they actually collected data on 430,000 projects. They coded them, they analyzed them. Um, a feel for your students, uh, minimum wage labor, uh, but, but an incredibly, incredibly impressive. Uh, for many of us in the environmental community that have been looking at these issues, uh, our databases were slightly smaller. We've uh, typically uh, you know, illustrated our points using case studies, but it is going to be incredibly invaluable to have kind of the rigor of the study that they did to kind of arm ourselves, to inform ourselves for the points that we want to make. But I must admit, I'm, I'm so glad you did that study and not me, but uh, very, very glad you did so. Um, the, the, and, a, and a third reason, I think the study, the book is great because it not only kind of looks backwards, but it also looks forward. It helps inform what we should do in the future. Um, economic and political power, as I mentioned, is shifting. With this, the values inherent in today's environmental movement is increasingly defined by the Asian middle class. The very nature of development assistance is changing. We have new development actors, new development institutions, new development strategies in place. And given this, the lessons that emerge from this book are going to be especially valuable to understand how environmental aid can play a transformative role in this very rapidly changing world. Uh, the book ends with a set of kind of 10 no-nonsense principles um, for how to improve the environmental performance of aid agencies. And I think they will be incredibly relevant uh, as we think about, as we look to the next 20 years and we look at how environmental aid is going to need to change. Some of my, uh, my own personal research right now is focused on adaptation, how we're going to raise, how we're going to channel, how we're going to spend the funds we need to adapt to a warming world. Some of the more recent estimates of the cost of adaptation finance range in the tens of billions of dollars. And there's a lot of increasing interest now in how do you identify those new mechanisms that are going to generate this aid, how you're going to find or the new institutions or use existing institutions to channel this aid. And so the book's lessons, at least from a very personal standpoint, are going to be incredibly illustrative to thinking about how we can ensure that all this new aid that we hope was going to come in the context of adaptation finance can lead to the positive environmental outcomes we lo we're looking for. So I have a very, very strong personal interest in the book. Uh, looking forward to seeing what you have to say and uh, commend the authors once again for, for an incredible body of work. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Tierney. Uh, I'll start us off today, and then I'm going to turn it over to Timmons Roberts and then to Brad Parks. First, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, uh, and I give a special thanks to the Wilson Center for sponsoring this event and for the World Resources Institute for co-sponsoring it. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity of uh, this sort of public type of forum uh, to share our research with you. I'd also like to thank our discussants, Manish and Robert, I uh, really appreciate your thoughts on this. Um, today what we'd like to do is talk to you about our new book and talk about the Project Level Aid database. The book is really the first major piece of research that has, come, had, that has been published that uses uh, the database. There have been a few articles that have come out uh, before that. But what we do in the book is something a little bit different than what most people have done who study environmental aid allocation or environmental aid effectiveness. We take a bird's eye view. Really, I suppose it's more of a satellite view. It's very, very far away from the projects on the ground. And there's an enormous amount of very good work that needs to be done doing case study analysis and process tracing that's right down there in the trenches, uh, either if you're looking at the allocation side or the effectiveness side. But what we do is use very, very large number of observations to give you sort of a satellite view of these patterns uh, over a long period of time. Uh, what we try to do in the book 
is to describe and then explain uh, these patterns. So Manish has already done this a little bit for me, so I'll be quite brief. Why does this topic matter? Uh, first, there's a lack of reliable information that's out there on who's given what to whom and how much and for what. And if we want to hold donors accountable or recipient governments accountable for the promises and the commitments that they make, uh, the first thing we need to do is know who has made what commitments and then who has given uh, what money. Uh, we need a clear descriptive picture uh, in order to make political judgments or in order to make moral judgments. And I think we've taken one small step in that direction. So when we looked at the history of uh, development in the environment, we noticed that the promises from the donor community, uh, whether we were looking at Stockholm or Rio, Johannesburg, Glen Eagles, they're actually quite similar. And uh, I think Timmons is going to talk a little bit about the degree to which those promises have been kept and how that varies uh, by donor. Second, it looks like I have lots of number ones up there. Uh, another important point, another number one. Uh, environmental aid is key to securing developing country participation in environmental agreements. This was certainly true with the Montreal Protocol Agreement. If you want to reduce CFC emissions, you had to get developing countries on board. And in order to get them on board, you needed to help compensate. You needed to help pay some of the costs of making that transition. Any post-2010 uh, global climate accord is going to be much more expensive, and it's cert a component of that, as Manish suggested, is going to be uh, using official assistance to uh, provide the lubrication, the grease, to do a deal, to come to a cooperative agreement to address these, uh, these global problems. And the, the amounts being discussed uh, for that kind of cooperation dwarf the amounts of aid that are discussed in our book. Uh, third, allocation patterns shape expected effectiveness of environmental aid. This book is not about aid effectiveness. It's about the allocation of aid. However, we think it has real important implications for aid effectiveness. First, there's a growing consensus in the political economy literature, people who study development. There's a growing consensus that uh, recipient countries with particular types of domestic institutions and domestic policies are more able and or willing to use aid effectively so that it achieves the, the results that were intended by, by the donor and possibly even the recipient. If you give to countries with sound policies and sound institutions, it's more likely you're going to get more environmental bang for your aid buck. Uh, another way of looking at aid effectiveness is to think about, well, if we're giving aid in order to protect the environment or fix environmental damage that's already been done, you want to make sure the aid is flowing to countries that need it. Uh, does aid flow to countries uh, of highest environmental need? Uh, if you <laughs> compare countries in terms of their uh, natural resource endowments, uh, giving environmental aid to Chad and giving environmental aid to Brazil might give you very different payoffs just in terms of if you think about the global stock of, uh, of environmental, environmental uh, goods. Uh, there's been a lot of previous research that's been done on environmental aid, but whether you are a government agency or an international organization or a private researcher, uh, there is a consensus that the type of data that we've had to date has not been adequate for analyzing uh, aid allocation. I won't read all these quotes for you, but from the IPCC all the way down to some of the leading scholars of international political economy, I think there's a real consensus that the type of data that we have presently is not adequate for the kind of analysis that we need to do. So the Project Level Aid project was launched in 2003. Uh, it actually started, like many research projects at William & Mary Start, as an undergraduate honors thesis. Brad Parks was a student of mine. He was a student of Timmons Roberts, and he was a student of Rob Hicks. And after the honors thesis defense, uh, we all agreed that this was one of the best theses we'd ever read, and we told Brad that he needed to turn this research into a book. And he agreed to do that on the condition that we write the book with him. And so we went to a bar, and we got out a napkin, and we jotted out what the book would look like and decided we could write this book in the summer of 2003. <laughs> we would use the data that everyone else used. We used the OECD DAC data. Uh, Brad's research was on bilateral aid allocation. My research was on multilateral aid allocation. Put a few theories together, dress it up, and we'd have a book uh, five or six months. Well, that was five years ago. Uh, and now we have a book. 
What we discovered in that summer, we discovered it quite early, was that the data that Brad had used in his thesis and the data that many of the rest of us had used to analyze aid effectiveness or aid allocation uh, had some serious problems. And I'm seeing nodding heads out in the audience, so I know some of you have used these, these data in the past. Uh, so the, the project started as a, it, we had an empirical question that we wanted to answer, and we didn't have the right kind of evidence that would allow us to answer our questions. That's what drove us at the beginning. Over the last three or four years, we've discovered that building a resource like the Plaid database has many other applications. So people in the real world at USAID, uh, the World Bank, the MCC, the NGO community have been interested in the Plaid database for other reasons. And I think we can, can exploit that for a variety of purposes, not just for academic research. Uh, very briefly, uh, we collect bilateral and multilateral aid data at the project level. We try to do it from 1970 until 2000. The data in the early part of the time series is not quite as good as that in the end. We only collect data from official sources, that is, governments or their multilateral agents, multilateral organizations whose members are governments. We do not collect data on FDI. We do not collect data on private donations. And I would agree with Manish, this is a, an area that we need to look at. Uh, and it, especially since an increasing amount of, of development flows from private foundations and non-governmental organizations. Uh, we have 21 major bilateral donors in our database now and more than 40 multilateral uh, donors, 428,000 projects and $2.3 trillion. This summer, uh, many of the students that are in the audience here, they're smiling up at me, they're helping us to do Plaid 2.0. So we are updating the database through 2006 and we are adding emerging donors and a variety of different fields in the database. Again, based on mostly our research interests and the interests of our collaborators in the NGO community. All the projects in the Project Level A database are systematically coded based on their expected environmental impact. So what this means is that, without getting too deeply into the weeds, there are two uh, trained coders that code every individual project for its expected impact on the environment. And I want to tell you a very brief story from the summer of 2003 about how we decided that we couldn't write a book on the effect of development assistance on the environment using the existing data. So the OECD DAC data uses these things called OECD sector codes. And so there's about either 180 or 230. There's a whole bunch of different sectors. And you might think that agricultural sector is going to have one impact on the environment, probably negative, and, you know, <coughs> Biodiversity projects are going to have a positive impact. And so if every individual sector was either good or bad or neutral for the environment, you could just use the sector codes that are already out there in the data. And you could proceed with an analysis. What this slide up here shows you is that if you look within an individual sector, you get dramatic variation. So this is just an example. This is the, uh, the forestry sector. And you could, some people would say forestry loans are bad for the environment. And other people would say forestry loans are good for the environment. And they'd both be right, because some forestry loans are good and some are bad. Depends on what you get money to do in the forest. Um, so what we, what we try to show you here is by using our own coding scheme, which I'll go through in just a minute, uh, in any individual year, some proportion of the forestry loans are environmentally friendly and some are environmentally damaging. So within this sector, you might have, and they'll have the exact same code, one project will be for clear cutting and another project will be for roping off the rainforest. So what we need to do in that case is look at each individual project, look at the descriptions and the project documents to try to figure out what they're actually doing in that particular project. So we code every, long, every project on five different, along a, a five point scale. I've simplified it here so that I just have three points. Uh, we have environmentally strictly defined projects, environmentally broadly defined, neutral, they're not likely necessarily on average to have a positive or negative effect. Uh, dirty broadly defined and dirty strictly defined. Um, and if you're interested in the details about how we do this, it's all in the book, but I'll just say very briefly, environmentally, environmentally strictly defined projects are those that will likely have a, an immediate and direct positive impact on the environment. Dirty strictly defined has immediate and negative impact on the nat natural environment and neutral on average we're likely to have no particular uh, effect. We use this term dirty not to make a normative judgment about what's good and bad. We just couldn't think of another word. We're trying to get, use scientific, uh, what we know about scientific evidence about the likely effects of particular types of activities to categorize these different projects. Uh, the other thing we don't do, 
uh, when, we, when we code a project as dirty, for example, we are not looking at any of the other positive or negative effects. We're not looking at you know, the humanitarian effects, which may be good or bad. We're not looking at the economic effects, which may be good or bad. Only thing we look at is the likely environmental impact. Um, OK, let me just talk about the organization of the book, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um, we have four research questions in the book. First, has aid been greened, and if so, by how much? Uh, I'm going to let Tim and Roberts talk about that uh, in just a minute. This is a fairly, this is the mapping that I talked about earlier. It's a descriptive uh, chapter that's fairly easy to consume, and I think it has some pretty interesting, uh, interesting results. We organized the book in the next six chapters so that it could re be read either by a stat head, you know, a real quantitatively oriented economist or political scientist, and the other uh, complementary chapter on the same question is qualitative with case studies and descriptive st statistics. So the next question we ask is, which donor governments spend the most on foreign assistance for the environment, and why do they do so? In this chapter, uh, we look at five cases of important donors, the United States, Britain, Germany, Denmark, and Japan, and we use qualitative evidence and descriptive st statistics to try to explain which ones are the most green and why that might be. The following chapter uses econometric analysis to try to explain uh, why you have this variation between these different donor countries. The third question asks, why do some donor governments delegate responsibility to allocate their own aid, their own taxpayers' dollars, to a multilateral organization rather than just doing it themselves? Why would anyone delegate this type of authority? We look at case studies of four different multilateral donors, some of them quite interesting that haven't been well studied before. We look at the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the GEF, and OPEC, uh, which I didn't know until I started this project, has a multilateral uh, finance arm. After we do the case studies in one chapter, then we follow that again with econometric analysis. The fourth, que fourth question asks, and I really think this is the heart of the book, frankly. I think this is the, the biggest academic contribution in the book. Which countries receive the most environmental aid and why? This is the inter-recipient model uh, for the book. The cases we study in detail are China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and Kenya. And then we use econometric analysis to try to answer this particular question. So right now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Timmons Roberts. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I get to do the fun job of talking about the findings now that all the setup has been completed. So I'm going to talk about the first two questions. Um, question one was, has aid been greened, and if so, by how much? So here's um, a graph where you can see I'm going to have three lines on here. This thing we call dirty aid, which is a shorthand again for projects that are likely to have negative environmental impacts. And again, we broke a lot of eggs to make this omelet. This is very simplifying, but at least we coded projects the same way across all the donors in all the years. And the best data was in the 80s and the 90s, and that's why we did that. And we had to stop with the data collection at some point. So what you can see here is this is first dirty aid um, stuck at about $30 billion a year. And in spite of all the campaigning of all the environmentalists in the 1980s over Polo Noroeste and the Brazilian Amazon, um, the Transmigrasi project in, in Indonesia and other large um, mega projects, um, in fact, this aid sort of stayed where it was, uh, but it did not increase. But as a proportion of aid, this ends up being a substantial drop. Aid, dirty aid went from about 55% of aid to about 30% of aid. So it's, a, uh, it's basically half as much of aid as it used to be. A big change that we noticed, and this is quite little discussed in this kind of literature, is environmentally neutral aid. That is, aid has shifted from these donors. Um, from, uh, at the beginning of the period, it was $15 billion, and it shifted to about $50 billion, so more than three times as much as it was. And it's now the majority of foreign aid. So these are for projects like you saw on that list before, education, health, agriculture, and finance, and so on. Bilateral environmental aid is down here at the bottom. Um, and it did increase substantially uh, from about a, a, you know, $3 billion at the beginning of the period to about $10 billion, uh, about 10% of aid. So did aid green? Well in some ways, some things happened that were quite important, and I'll get to that some more. But bilateral environmental aid increased by 370% over the 1980s and the 1990s, and multilateral environmental aid increased by 140%. Dirty aid, though, remains a fairly large factor, larger 
than environmental aid. So um, we came up with this idea of a, an index of greening. And this is just the amount of dirty aid divided by the amount of environmental aid. So you can see sort of by each donor, we, we, we plot these graphs throughout the book, uh, whether they're, how, how quickly they've, they've greened. So you can see at the beginning of this um, period that the donors were, all of them, giving over 10 times as much to dirty projects as they were to environmental projects. But we, this graph really shows quite a stark change. Um, that is, both multilaterals and bilaterals greened or began in the 80s to change from much more dirty projects to a, large, a smaller fraction of dirty projects compared to their environmental projects. The ratio dropped a lot from 10 down to about 4 for the multilateral banks and uh, granting agencies and then down to about 2 times as much for the bilaterals. This was a bit of a surprise for us because most of the uh, protesting groups have focused on the World Bank and other big multilateral donors. So to see that bilateral donors were the ones that had greened more and continued to green through the 90s, you know, long after the Rio Earth Summit, uh, was a surprise. We also coded all these projects by whether they addressed local environmental issues or global environmental issues. And again, we're using a shorthand here, green and brown. So green projects address regional and global public goods, things like climate change and biodiversity. And brown projects address local public goods, like clean water, sewage, wastewater treatment, urban envi other env urban environmental issues, erosion control, desertification, and so on. So you can see from this project by project coding, if you add it all up, consistently coded across the period and all the donors, you find some important changes. And that is that green aid, this uh, global public goods, was a very small fraction of aid through the whole 1980s. And really about 1989 or 90, there's a very sharp increase. And it's on both types of donors, both multilaterals at the t I'm sorry, at the bottom of the slide and the bilaterals at the top. You can see there's sort of a phase shift through the 1990s as this green portion gets substantially larger. It's still the majority of environmental aid, as we categorized it, was more for these local issues. So it, then we looked, um, we went through and did keyword searches through all the projects um, for these types of local and global projects. And we have four case studies um, of water aid, land aid, that is including for desertification, climate change aid, and for biodiversity. And I think the the, this graph really quite speaks for itself, that most environmental aid has gone for water projects. And there's a long discussion we have in this book about this maybe tension between the donors who may be more interested in global public goods like climate change and biodiversity that their taxpayers are worried about and the recipient nations who are more interested in uh, sewer projects, water projects, and so on. So there's going to be some more discussion of that a little later. Um, Another thing that's, that you can notice is that climate change aid does come up, but it's, there's some climate change aid all the way back into the early 80s. If you consistently code energy efficiency projects as climate change projects, they go way back. And there's interesting things we found through the data set of this sort of fads in aid lingo and of topical areas of interest um, that, that I think uh, make it quite interesting to see how these you know, different topic issues rise and fall. In this study of bio, I'm sorry, of uh, Desertification aid shows really that that issue has been largely neglected and it had one small bump in the early 90s and it's remained a tiny portion of aid. So to sort of sum up this topic, we went back and looked at the, the Agenda 21, this huge document uh, that was developed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And in there, there are prescriptions made um, on how much aid would be needed to address these uh, different types of environmental issues. So we go through and add those up. That is, how much new and additional official development assistance would be needed for global environmental issues. So we started to think about this as maybe a, a doctor prescribing medicine for a patient. Right? The earth is the patient. The doctor is the international community saying, all right, well, how much is needed for, this, uh, for these issues? And here you can see for water aid, it was uh, prescribed was about a billion, $6 billion a year. Uh, land aid was $18 billion and so on. And so you can see in this last column here that the actual amount that was delivered 
of those prescriptions uh, varies tremendously between these different sectors. Water aid received 92% of the dose that was prescribed. Land aid only 2%. Climate change 4% and uh, biodiversity about 7%. So there's two points here. If you expect this patient to get better, here's some evidence of why it may not be getting better. And then there was also that earlier slide of uh, you know, the amount of funding still going for big development projects. And then the second point here is that if you want to understand why there's been less maybe cooperation by developing countries, they've often been promised this aid as new and additional, and it's often not been delivered. So now just quickly, I'll talk about uh, research question two, and then I'm going to pass it on to Brad. Um, which donor governments spend the most on foreign assistance for the environment and why? Um, we have a couple of tables where we rank countries uh, on who's giving the most. Here you can see in Denmark, per person, Everybody's giving about $181 a year in, uh, in environmental aid. In the U.S., it's less than $20. And in, in most countries, it's about $20. In some northern European countries, in Japan, it was in the 70s and 80s. So is that pretty clear? There's quite a range here. If you look over time and as a percent of the aid budget, the U.S. is um, here number seven, about 11 percent. There's a number of countries around us um, giving about 10 to 15 percent. And then again, Denmark and Germany at the top. But what you can see also in this is how every, multi oh, sorry, every bilateral donor, with the minor exception of New Zealand and Norway, actually increased, did green during this period substantially. So the amounts of money have gone way up. And then here's just an illustrative graph showing this ratio that I talked about before. Uh, from USAID was about three to four times as much money going for uh, dirty projects as for green projects, environmental projects. And it's down now where there's actually more funding for environmental projects than for ones that we categorized as dirty. And it stayed down in the whole 1990s. We then do these um, elaborate multivari multivariate models. And unfortunately, our fourth author, who we really have to acknowledge here, Rob Hicks, has been uh, he's our economist who understands Heckman two-stage modeling and all these other types of statistical tests that we've done where there's two stages of whether, whether a country gets any environmental aid and then what, how much they actually get. So we come up with these sort of theories about what would predict, what would explain how much commitment a donor has to giving for environment. So you'd expect maybe wealthier countries would be, giving, would be more interested in protecting the global environment or ones that have more post-materials values, have, which has been a concept much discussed in the um, political science literature and in sociology, my field. Um, whether they've shown their interest in environmental protection by passing strong environmental laws domestically, the number three there, and whether they've shown their de dedication to the environment uh, by signing environmental treaties or other in international environmental agreements. Um, and then there's this, this discussion of the um, coalitions of the green and greedy. That is, that we would expect there to be strong participation in, and a real lobbying force in a national capital for spending on foreign aid for the environment if there are both entrepreneurs who can make money from selling green technology and also strong environmental organizations. And then we also have some indicators of the lobbying strength of uh, dirty industries. Maybe they would tend to be negatively associated with green aid. And then finally, um, the setup of the domestic institutions. Mike's an institutionalist. There's a whole literature on how the government is structured and how decisions are made, you know, whether there's vetoes, many ways that different groups can veto a, a policy, um, the strength of leftist parties, the corporatism, the way that different groups like labor unions and environmentalists actually get to participate in the government, and so on, checks and balances. So just very briefly on that. Um, we were better at explaining this sort of drop in dirty aid as a proportion of aid than in this rise of environmental aid. The wealthier and post-materialist countries, that is where the people responded to this Engelhardt survey um, in the ways that were expected for post-materialist values, caring about things besides just material goods, um, and do invest less in these dirty projects, but they're not necessarily investing more in environmental projects, another surprise to us. But there is, anyway, support for these uh, environmental groups that we're campaigning against um, the dirtiest projects. Countries with stronger coalitions of the green and greedy spend less on dirty aid and more on green aid. So that prediction bore out. And then finally, um, this is my last point, um, countries with higher rates of environmental treaty ratification and compliance did have higher environmental aid budgets. 
So Brad, you want to take over? Yeah. So we're actually going to skip over research, research question three because uh, there's just too much dense material and we'd encourage you to buy the book and read that, uh, those <laughs> two chapters. We just don't have enough time to cover them. So we're going to skip right to uh, what Mike said, uh, you know, we think of as one of the more interesting uh, chapters from the book. And the, the research question is which countries receive the most environmental aid and why? And so as you can see on this slide, uh, some of the largest recipients of environmental aid are really not that surprising. You've got China, India, Brazil, Indonesia. So some of these countries have large stocks in natural capital. Think of, you know, the Amazon rainforest in, the Brazil, in Brazil. Uh, other countries have, you know, huge populations or they're huge economies that are contributing to global environmental problems. So think of China or India. But there's also some unusual entries on this top ten list of environmental aid recipients during the 1990s. So for example, at first blush, it's not entirely clear why Turkey and Egypt would be getting over $2 billion uh, in environmental aid. And it's also just worth pointing out, we sort of have the, the green-brown coloration here to show you uh, how much they're getting of each type. And if you look at Egypt, Egypt, Argentina, Turkey, these unusual uh, entries on the top 10 list, they, these are more geostrategic countries. And as you can see, they tend to get more brown aid than they do green aid. And then at the very bottom of this graph, you see uh, least developed countries. So this is, I think, a group of 49 or so, the poorest countries in the world. And the opposite is true in their case. They're getting a very small sliver of brown aid, and the lion's share of the funding is uh, green aid. And we think. Uh, this, this raises lots of very interesting questions about leverage between and the bargaining process between uh, donor and recipient countries. So these descriptive statistics obviously beg some deeper questions about donor motivations. And one of the main questions that we had when we were going into this project was, is environmental aid allocated in the same way that all other types of foreign aid are allocated? Um, or is there something, are there unique properties to environmental aid or donors, do they operate differently uh, when they're allocating this type of assistance? So uh, in other words, we're trying to figure out, are donors, when they're allocating environmental aid, are they being what we call eco-functional? So are they trying to maximize the, the environmental rate of return on their environmental aid investment? Or is the decision-making calculus being driven by political and uh, you know, geostrategic commercial issues uh, that others have you know, identified as uh, drivers of foreign aid allocation more broadly? And so like in the other chapters, we try to study this issue uh, both econometrically and then with, I think, five, five case studies. OK. So as you can see from this list, uh, some of the hypotheses that we tested really had not very much to do with the environment. Uh, but these, some of these factors do have to do with broader determinants of foreign aid allocation. So you th see things on this list like, does the recipient country have an existing commercial relationship? Is it a big trading partner? Uh, does it vote in the UN consistently with uh, the particular donor country? Is it a does it have a former colonial relationship with the donor country? Uh, but then we also tested for some factors that we think could be, hopefully, uh, that are specific to environmental aid, these sort of eco-functional factors. And so we looked at whether donors screen recipients based on things like their global or regional environmental significance, the strength of their environmental policies and public institutions, their willingness to participate uh, in international environmental treaties, and also the severity of local environmental damage in, in that country. And what we found is that there is some evidence that environmental aid is being allocated according to eco-functional criteria. That is, some donors are targeting countries where they think their environmental aid may actually make a difference. It may ameliorate environmental problems. But at the same time, many of these same factors that plague or that drive uh, other types of, of foreign aid, uh, you know, the UN voting patterns, the political loyalty, the commercial relationships, they also loom very, very large in the environmental aid allocation process. 
so just very quickly, uh, what, did, what did we find in specific terms? First of all, we found that in general, bilateral and multilateral donors do target countries with a potential to deliver global environmental benefits. So think of you know, reducing carbon emissions in China. We also found some evidence that donors target countries in their neighborhood that may be big contributors to regional environmental problems. So you might think of the acid rain coming from China over to Japan. There was a fairly robust response. Japan started putting you know, scrubbers on uh, some of these uh, factories. So uh, this regional effect that showed up was not uh, only observed with respect to environmental aid. We also tested it for dirty aid and neutral aid, but it was stronger for environmental aid. The effect was. So that made us think maybe there's something going on here in terms of donors' responsiveness to a regional environmental problem that really touches, uh, touches them directly. We also tried to look at local environmental issues. How severe is local environmental degradation? And this factor did not uh, seem to have an effect on environmental aid allocation, but we have to say we ended up, we had endless discussions about how to go about measuring that. Uh, and we ended up settling on a water quality index that has some serious problems. And so uh, you should probably take, we certainly did, took this finding or non-finding finding, uh, with a grain of salt. And then we also tested for factors that a donor might expect to influence this environmental rate of return, like does it, but that may not be ex, uh, an explicitly environmental issue, but may uh, impinge upon whether that environmental aid investment's going to be effective. So does the country have a reasonably meritocratic civil service? Uh, does, do they have economic, sound economic policies that encourage entrepreneurship and innovation? Do they have relatively strong environmental policies? Um, and so what we found uh, was pretty interesting. We, we modeled, as uh, Timmins alluded to, we modeled this process as a, the allocation process in two stages. First stage is what we call the gatekeeping stage. Are we even going to sign an aid contract with you? So are we giving you any money or not? Or not? And then the second stage is the amount stage. Okay, you're in, you're in the club. We're going we're gonna to give you a contract, an aid contract. Now we have to determine how much to give to you. And what we found is that at that first gatekeeping stage, these sort of eco-functional criteria seem to play a bigger role than at the amount stage. And in some ways, at least to me, this wasn't that surprising. Um, you know, I work for the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and we have this elaborate system for determining whether countries will receive assistance or not receive assistance. So that's a great example of the gatekeeping stage. But we don't use the same set of policy and institutional criteria to determine how much a country gets. So um, that's what we found on uh, the eco-functional variables. OK, now for the bad news. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, we found that the impact of these eco-functional variables is small when compared with some of the more traditional determinants of foreign aid allocation, the, the geostrategic, commercial, colonial legacy issues. And this point is really important. Uh, I just want to emphasize it. You know, Mike alluded to the fact that we're studying allocation, but there, this research project also ha uh, speaks to the effectiveness question. Uh, there's a as many of you probably know, there's a growing consensus that uh, if aid is allocated along political lines, it probably has a lower likelihood of improving development outcomes or environment outcomes than otherwise. So the fact that um, these sort of commercial geostrategic issues are having such a huge impact, we would think is not great news for actually addressing environmental problems. Okay, so now I'd just like to step back and re kind of return to the big picture on what's happening in the global landscape of greening, the greening of aid. What can we say with confidence based on the data that we've been working with? A couple of things. The first thing is that bilateral, environment, bilateral environmental aid has increased very substantially by about 370% uh, over the 1990s uh, 1980s and 1990s. Multilateral environmental aid has also more than doubled, 140 uh, percent, but not, not nearly as much as bilateral. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we see that 
environmental aid as a total fraction, as a, as a percentage of total aid, still is fairly low. It's 10% uh, and roughly at about $10 billion. And then we also uh, picked up on this very discernible trend with dirty aid. As a fraction of total aid, it's coming down from about 55% in the 70s to roughly about 30%. And then, of course, a big part of the, the story over the last few decades is the skyrocketing of neutral aid. And then, of course, there's tremendous variation once you start looking at specific donors. You know, some this is happening uh, in Denmark more quickly. The greening process happened more quickly and more extensively uh, than, than for some of its peers. All right. I would like to talk a little bit about the limitations of our study. We, we tried to do a lot, but we couldn't do everything. And so we tried to take stock in the conclusion of the book of uh, what can we not answer, what are future uh, research directions that we or others might, might take to try to wrap our hands around some of these uh, big issues. So the first limitation is that we set out to study aid allocation patterns across countries. But aid is also allocated across regions and districts within countries. And there's probably a lot of interesting variation within recipient countries uh, that we're, we're not picking up here. And while we're not there yet, uh, at some point we do hope that PLAD data, just because of the, the nature of the way that the data is organized, that it will enable research, researchers to do this type of analysis. A second, type, uh, second limitation is that our models assume, these econometric models that we use, they assume that allocation decisions in one sector, let's say the environment sector, uh, do not influence allocation decisions in another sector. Now, in reality, we know that this assumption probably fails to consider a complex dimension of aid contracts between donors and recipients. For example, it's possible that recipients will only uh, except environmental aid if it comes, uh, if it's sort of bundled with other types of more highly valued aid. You know, a lot of uh, recipient countries would much prefer to have a productive sector grant or loan uh, than have a, a green uh, grant or loan that a that, uh, northern country wants to provide. So that's a limitation. Uh, another limitation that we, we uh, acknowledge in the book is that we conflate grants and loans. And now this is not so problematic for the econometric models because we're looking at the share of uh, total aid going to the environment sector or the share of total aid going to the dirty sector. And so since uh, if a, a donor gives mostly loans like the World Bank, loans are in the numerator and the denominator, so the ratio is still going to be pretty comparable across donors. It's more problematic for the descriptive statistics that we've presented because some, some of these uh, loans in here are, have a concessional rate, but you know, they're not a uh, hundred million dollar grant is not the same as getting uh, a loan f from the World Bank for a hundred million dollars. I should say though that one of the neat aspects of this PLAD database that we've created is that there's a grant element uh, variable in the database. So uh, we hope that other researchers will go if they so desire and reanalyze some of the claims that we've made uh, by exploiting that, that information. Another uh, limitation uh, that we are painfully aware of is that a lot of people uh, talk about this process of marbling or mainstreaming, this phenomenon of marbling or mainstreaming environmental assistance into larger projects. And we know of at least one study Mike was one of the authors of this study back in 2003 uh, that found that marbled environmental assistance at the World Bank was a, a significant percentage of total environmental assistance. So uh, we are not capturing that in the database right now. And so that, uh, that could be potentially problematic. And we've heard lots of anecdotal accounts of more infrastructure projects, including these environmental components. But figuring out just how much of this marbled environmental aid is, is uh, in these otherwise non-environmental projects, it's not so easy to figure out. You have to drill down and look at the actual budgets of individual projects. And Ryan Powers, a student from uh, William Mary who's with us today, is doing some excellent research in this area. And his initial results, uh, using the uh, same sort of data that we're working with, are that 
uh, mainstreamed environmental funding at the World Bank after the period that we study from 2001 to 2006 has actually gone down significantly. But there's this very curious pattern, and we've got, uh, we can come back to this during the Q&A, we have it in an extra slide, where as mainstream environmental aid is going down from 2001 to 2006, the percentage of World Bank publications that have an environment theme went from 5% to 33%. So that's a pretty big uh, jump, and I think it raises lots of questions that uh, we, may, we may be discussing in just a bit. We're also aware of this criticism that some of the dirty projects, you know, we showed this decline in the dirty to environmental ratio, may be migrating to export promotion agencies or political risk insurance agencies like Exim or OPIC. Uh, or private banks where there's lower levels of transparency and oversight. And we've done some preliminary environmental coding of Exim and OPIC, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. And finally, uh, this point was kind of made before, but I'll m make it again, and that is uh, our environmental coding scheme here is designed to capture the expected environmental impact of projects. In other words, donor intentions or donor motivations, not the actual environmental impact. And we understand that some quote-unquote environmental projects uh, may not end up delivering significant environmental benefits. And in some cases, environmental projects uh, may actually damage the environment. We also understand that donors can make course corrections during implementation, and a project that initially you might think was dirty or neutral uh, may be modified in a way that it ends up yielding some significant environmental benefits. But for us, this, act this concept of actual environmental impact is, is very different from donor intentions and motivations, and that's what we set out to do with this research project. All right, I'll be very quick here. Uh, we, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits of Plaid that we want to bring to people's attention is that donors make a lot of claims about how much they are funding uh, environmental projects. And a lot of donors are under a lot of public pressure to show that they are greener than their peers. And so there are strong incentives to over-report your commitment. And so we did a, a nice little test in the book uh, because DFID, uh, the UK's primary aid agency, they have their own sort of project level database and they assign uh, an environmental marker to projects and they claim that during the 1990s, about 25% of their projects were environmental. So we took that same sample of projects and took the, the criteria that we've established for what's environmental, what's not, and we came up with an estimate of 10% of their projects were environmental. So it's a pretty big difference, and I think it speaks to this issue of uh, how do we hold donors accountable? Well, there needs to be some sort of independent evaluation of what's, what, what's going on. Just very briefly, and we can talk about this more during the Q&A, we talk in the conclusion a bit about what is environmental aid going to look like in 10 years or 20 years. And uh, this probably doesn't come as a major surprise to most of you, but we do think that climate change is going to have a huge impact on what donors choose to fund and what they don't uh, choose to fund in the future. The latest uh, estimates from the UNFCCC is that by 2030, $100 billion a year will be needed to finance mitigation activities just in the developing world. Uh, and then on the adaptation side, the estimates are there's a wide band from 28 to $67 billion a year. Uh, and so on the mitigation side, think of projects like uh, diffusing cleaner energy efficient technologies, reducing deforestation, uh, perhaps increasing carbon sequestration. And on the adaptation side, you know, we might expect to see more funding for early warning systems that prevent the worst effects of heat waves, floods, droughts. We may see construction of more seawalls, uh, more climate proofing of ag projects or irrigation projects. But it, it's worth noting that uh, not all of this will necessarily uh, be foreign aid in the traditional sense. Uh, much of it could end up coming from what's being called carbon finance, for example, through the clean development mechanism, which is basically a market-based mechanism that allows industrialized com companies or carbon-intensive 
uh, industrialized countries or carbon intensive companies to earn emissions credits through investments in projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions many times overseas. So that's one major area where we see things heading. Okay, future directions. Uh, this is more broadly about uh, the project level aid database, not as much about environmental aid. The next step in this research project is that we would like to transition towards making this database an easy to use, timely, comprehensive database on internet, international development finance for NGOs, for activists, and for researchers. We think this could be a huge tool, not just for research purposes, but also for donors that are trying to coordinate their efforts and for NGOs and activists that want, an, or want or need a tool to monitor donor commitments. Because as Timmons or Mike mentioned, at all these conferences, Rio in 92, uh, Joburg in 2002, Glen Eagles in 2005, Donors make you know, very uh, large commitments. We're gonna ramp up environmental spending by you know, X amount, and th there's rarely a follow-up on how much is actually being spent on, on the environment, so, or any other sector for that matter, and so Plaid may be a great tool for uh, increasing accountability in that area. We have received uh, very generous support from the National Science Foundation and now the Hewlett Foundation uh, going forward. And we're expecting that another major foundation uh, may be providing support very soon. So this, uh, this task that we have ahead of us is a major one, and we appreciate the support that we've received from some of these private foundations. Now, what are we going to do with that support? We want to update the database by the end of 2008 through 2006, uh, because there is a lag with the, the reporting. We want to reduce that lag. Uh, we also want to expand to other countries, emerging donors like China, Venezuela, uh, Poland. So uh, that, that's going to be a major focus. And then finally, I just want to say a few words about the potential that the database offers in terms of doing sector-specific and subsector-specific aid effectiveness research. This next slide is a nice visual representation of the existing macroeconomic literature on aid effectiveness. Basically, the literature tries to evaluate the effect that total aid flows have on uh, development outcomes like economic growth or infant mortality. The problem is that this type of research design conflates very different types of aid. So for example, when you evaluate the impact that total aid flows have on economic growth, which has been done quite a bit, you're forced to combine productive sector funding for things like infrastructure or agricultural productivity with support for peacekeeping operations, landmine clearance, free and fair elections, HIV AIDS assistance, <laughs> drug trafficking, you name it. Uh, so as you can imagine, this is, this is seriously problematic because many of these types of aid are not designed to increase economic growth. They're designed to do things like support refugees or strengthen civil society or protect biodiversity. And so in some ways, uh, the existing macroeconomic aid effectiveness literature may end up obscuring more than it reveals or sheds light on. And so one of the major advantages of Plaid is that it allows you to unbundle aid into its constituent parts. Not just environmental aid, but uh, all, all different types of aid. So you can answer questions or try to answer questions like, what kind of impact does biodiversity aid have on species loss and vegetation density? How does education aid impact enrollment rates and literacy rates? Is HIV AIDS assistance reducing prevalence rates or increasing access to antiretroviral drugs? Uh, and this is uh, what we hope the next generation of macro aid effectiveness literature. Uh, and basically the idea is focus on the, the impact of specific types of aid on specific development outcomes. And then finally, I'd just like to conclude by uh, highlighting the, the very practical potential that the Plaid database hopefully will offer in terms of donor coordination. As many of you know, in most developing countries, there's usually not a central repository where you can find all bilateral and multilateral projects in a given sector or subsector. But having this information is invaluable. It can go a very long ways towards minimizing overlap and reducing projects that work at cross purposes. Uh, Bill Easterly and others have written a lot about some of the more egregious cases that have led to huge efficiency losses. 
And so one of our next steps is to work with our funders and to make Plaid searchable and easy to use for people in the field or elsewhere so they can access this information where they are and uh, use it to uh, do their work better. So I think I'll stop there and maybe we'll turn it over to Rob. Oh, yes. Uh, Jeff and Karen, many thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my first remark is warm congratulations to all three of you on such a galvanizing book and with such exquisite timing too. The need for your book has never been greater in my opinion. Uh, to me, the priority is to heed the book's dire warnings and you've, all three of you mentioned it. Uh, you predict an increase in funding for extractive industries that means even more finance for fossil fuels, deforestation, and mining, the most environmentally destructive sectors of all. Now, everyone concerned with um, their environmental life support systems and um, your own taxpayers' dollars should implement the book's commendable 10 principles of improving aid. Um, this book is a, a research firmly based um, academic treaties, uh, which is an absolutely necessary first step. But the second step to me is more interesting. I'm not a statistician, and that is the prescription. This book is not prescriptive. The nearest it comes to being prescriptive, these wonderful, highly commendable 10 principles <clears throat> on improving aid agencies. And the reason for that is, um, I think the question mark on the book's cover should be deleted. To me, there's no, <clears throat> no question but that aid, or at least World Bank Group aid, is degreening itself fast. Mm. Um, I can only speak for the World Bank uh, Group, not any other aid agencies. Um, <clears throat> so my question is slightly different from the book's question, and that is, has the World Bank Group morphed into the world's biggest financier in developing countries of greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels, deforestation, and livestock production. Um, if so, the World Bank Group is degreening itself fast. This absorbing book asks, have the multilaterals been greened? In my view, the answer is clear, no, at least not the World Bank Group for the following reasons. Let's look at the World Bank's recent environmental track record. So my data set is slightly different from that of the book. I just look at the very recent uh, track record of the World Bank. Between 92 and 05, the World Bank Group committed about 28 billion to fossil fuel projects, 17 times more than its financing for, for renewables. Recently, the World Bank has been ramping up finance for coal, agri-fuels or biodiesel, vast industrial cattle ranches in the Amazon, deforestation worldwide, including clearance of tsunami buffering mangrove forests for shrimp culture in Indonesia and, and elsewhere, widespread industrial logging in the Congo, Cambodia, Peru, and elsewhere. That's the facts that I propose to show that the World Bank Group at least is degreening itself. And five more facts to support the argument that the bank has already degreened itself or is well on the way to degreening itself. Um, there was a very beneficial decade-long moratorium on logging in old growth or intact tropical forest. That policy was uh, rescinded in recently, 2002. Um, since 2002, the World Bank has ramped up industrial logging and road building in tropical forests and elsewhere. The inspection panel has examined most of these projects, the logging projects, the new logging projects, and found policy violations in every single one. Uh, the midterm review of the new pro-logging policy uh, was suppressed. It was written but not available. Second fact, uh, coal. Uh, there was a decade-long de facto moratorium against coal financing in the 1990s. It ended in 2003, as soon as the Extractive Industry Review recommending phasing out of coal. So the Independent Extractive Industry Review, catalyzed by the World Bank, said phase out of coal. 
and the World Bank did absolutely the opposite and, and phased in coal. Third point is somewhat similar, in, not on coal but on dams. There was an independent World Commission on dams reported in the year 2000, recommended um, huge uh, precautions in, in um, dams and, and, and uh, recommended getting out of the ones which produce a lot of methane and displace a lot of people. The World Bank, on the other hand, since the World Commission on Dams report of year, year 2000, has ramped up dams, including methane producing dams and people that, uh, dams which uh, displace large numbers of people. The use of force as a routine systematic tool in economic development is just outrageous and I hope some academics look into the routine use of force in voluntary resettlement. Um, the fourth point is after the bank adopted two excellent strategies, the livestock strategy and the nutrition strategy, very recently, 01 and 06 respectively, IBD, IBRD and IDA then phased out of cattle and livestock projects. Since those two strategies were adopted, IFC, on the other hand, has ramped up livestock production projects to the tune of about $2 billion. So IFC claims that they're immune or exempt from following World Bank policies. Fifth, uh, the World Bank's environmental and social departments, as you know, have been demoted. They're now subordinated under the infrastructure vice presidency, which to me is a brazen example of regulatory capture, where environmental regulators and social regulators acting in the public interest become dominated by the vested interests of the in infrastructure trickle-down lobby, as I call them. Okay, so if you buy any of that, what's the way forward? In my view, the World Bank should be doing almost the opposite of what they are doing at the moment. Climate change is the world's biggest market failure. Your research uh, shows that very clearly. It's the most severe environmental threat at the moment. It's practically irreversible to all intents and purposes. And above all, it's anti-poor. The poor suffer first from climate change. They suffer the longest, and they suffer the most. And the crucial point that would come out very well in the book, there's only a dangerously brief period of time remaining before our options diminish fatefully. In my view, the World Bank should de-emphasize adaptation. Uh, that's the seawall approach that the book mentions, and should de-emphasize carbon trading. Instead, it should make prevention of climate change the top priority. Prevention means vastly accelerating renewable energy, promptly halting this enormous financing of fossil fuels, the increased financing of deforestation and livestock, according to the IPCC. We'd all be better off if there was no financing for industrial-scale livestock. IFC's secret Amazon strategy must be reoriented to halt deforestation, particularly when deforestation is for sugarcane, alcohol, cattle ranching, monoculture, soy, and industrial logging. Instead, the bank should galvanize the opposite, tree plantations, conservation, and regeneration of forests. This is all borne out by Sir Nicholas Stern, used to be the bank's chief economist and vice president, um, who came back after he had published his uh, UK government DFID report and advised the bank their top priority should be to get out of deforestation and industrial logging and control forest fires, and on the contrary, plant trees, not cut them down. Um, then on the institutional side, the environmental and social departments need to have their independence uh, restored and their voice strengthened commensurate with global risks. Instead of being demoted, they should be promoted. The en environment, poverty reduction and, and social impacts clearly merit at least their own VP. I know all VPs are being demoted now. There are about three ranks of VPs, but anyway, uh, environment and social now don't have their own voice at the VP level. And in my view, the multilateral development goals, which the, this book doesn't harp on all that much, should be the paramount goal of the bank. In the heyday of the 1980s and 1990s, when Manish and I were uh, driving ourselves nuts, trying to what, what we used to call put lipstick on the pig, <laughs> in other words, trying to toss up a real dog of a project. Um, anyway, in the 80s and 90s, 
we, we were getting towards direct poverty reduction. That was our priority, together with health, education, nutrition, and job creation. Those were our priorities. And they culminated, of course, in the World 2000 and the magnificent multi-millennial development goals. Most unfortunately, since then, uh, because Manishina left, of course, <laughs> Since then, the pendulum has swung backwards towards inefficient and leaky trickle-down economics, corporate friendliness, big infrastructure, dams, highways, coal, oil, and globalization, as this fine book warns. Sadly, the World Bank Group now de-emphasizes the Millennial Development Goals. Direct poverty reduction is threatened by IFCs pledging to become the biggest single donor of IDA. In other words, IFC, the corporate sector, has taken over IDA, um, which is the world's the biggest paradigm shift in recent World Bank Group history. But it's almost unknown. It's certainly no consultation or, or discussion of that uh, huge paradigm shift. IDA, in our day, when Manish and I were there, used to be the noblest branch of uh, the World Bank, helping the poorest of the poor. Um, as IDA's biggest donor, IFC now calls the shots in IDA, giving priority to corporate welfare over the poor. So in my view, it's high time for the pendulum of economic fads to start swinging back in the opposite direction, away from championing corporate interests and get back to championing the interests of the poor, pushing environmentally sustainable development, whatever that is, at the full set of MDGs. Formal, transparent, and annual recalibration of the balance is overdue between these two parts, between direct poverty reduction on the one hand and inefficient, leaky trickle-down on the poor. That balance has to be looked at at least annually and adjusted. Accountability, too, is slipping. Transparency and disclosure policies began in a minor way in about 93 and are slowly improving, but all policies and strategies um, are still concocted and, ad and adopted in secret. Why are policies exempt from transparency and accountability? Why is IFC exempt from official bank strategies? Is IFC now the least accountable of the bank's uh, arms? IFC doesn't disclose achievements in, in its project-specific correction action plans. It publishes the corrective action plan, what the borrower or people, the groups in receiving the investments are supposed to do, but the moment that's over, then there's no indication of how much the borrower has complied with the action plan. And as long as the, the outcomes of the uh, caps are not disclosed, it means IFC's performance standards are a total charade. There's no formal mechanism in any, any part of the World Bank Group for handling complaints related to disclosure or consultation on any strategy or any policy, only on projects. The inspection panel and, and CAO, Compliance Advisor Ombudsman, can't touch all strategies and policies. They're restricted to the very inefficient retail level of projects. The World Bank Group's Independent Evaluation Group, IEG, has become superbly effective in showing how to improve development outcomes and assiduously points out deficiency in the accountability mechanisms. But the inspection panel and the ombudsperson uh, are routinely disputed by the World Bank, and which ignores the findings to a large extent of, of all three accountability mechanisms. Um, let me end with a, an amusing anecdote. I haven't uh, analyzed uh, more than 400,000 projects, and so I'm going to talk about one project. Uh, excuse myself for that. Um, it is a, an, an anecdote. You know the plural of anecdote? Data. <laughs> uh, last month, the bank approved a $54 million project, which illustrates most of what the book has said and what I've been saying. The project manufactures cheeses in India, flies them to Japan to supply Pizza Hut. Project appraisal omitted any assessment of greenhouse gas emissions or climate risks. Accountability is zero. 
in terms of respecting local religious taboos on holy cows. In this project, the World Bank promotes the interests of the well-to-do, flying food away from those who need more to those that don't. Despite soaring claims of fighting the global food crisis and climate change, the bank makes cows fly. Financing methane emissions from cows and carbon emissions from jet aeroplanes, one of the most potent combinations imaginable of exacerbating the global food crisis and climate risk at the same time. Let me end. I urge you to read Green Aid. Not only is it fascinating, it's very important for our livelihoods. Above all, implement the bank's, the book's 10 conditions, and our civilization might just have a chance. But act now. Time is short. Vigorously promote the rapid, deep greening of aid. Demand an end to World Bank Group recklessness with our life support systems from now on. Warm congratulations to Timmers Roberts, Michael Cherney, and Brad Parks. Thanks also to Jeff DeBelco and Karen Ben Keller for inviting me. Many thanks to you all. Terrific. Well, I want to thank all the speakers, and as usual, Robert really holds back on his uh, <laughs> comments and suggestions. Thank you all very much. We have uh, some time now for um, a, a discussion. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you could uh, identify yourself and wait for the microphone to come from one of my colleagues so that folks online can hear as well. Sonia, why don't we start the gentleman in the black right there in the middle? Oh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. It was Excellent discussion, very interesting topic. Uh, my name is Adam Zuckerman. I'm from ActionAid International. Um, and I have a question sort of about um, the deliverance of aid in that, I guess, what is your opinion on sort of local purchase of aid? I know that in Rome recently, the US um, pledged $5 billion for the global food crisis. Um, but only 50 million of that were actually, was actually for local purchase um, and sort of I guess if you could speak about the environmental and also um, efficiency impacts of that. I defer first. I, I tell you what, well, why don't I give you a chance to, we'll collect a couple and then you can have a chance to collect your thoughts. So I'm go down front here. Hi, Catherine Grover from American University. I wanted to thank the panel. It was a very interesting discussion. And I also want to ask two questions. Um, the first is to ask you very briefly if you, in relation to your coding scheme, you had acknowledged that um, one of the weaknesses is it doesn't measure actual environmental impact. And I wondered if you could um, tell us whether you've done any cross-checking on the ground of that coding scheme, of how it actually matches up with, with projects on the ground. Um, and secondly, the connection between the allocation decision and effectiveness, or even the allocation decision, the um, environmental agency in town here that was my former employer, one of the things that um, we had discussions about very often was this issue of the size of the country and its impact, but also how much our aid would impact that country. So, for example, um, we could put $200,000 into a China project because we should be in China, because it's a big GHG emitter, but should we also then compare that to a project of 200,000 in Ghana where we could be the big boy and um, really make an impact and therefore have a um, project that could then be moved else, elsewhere and have a diffusion value, um, et cetera, that might make it more effective. Thank you. Okay, right here in the front Thanks. Hi, I'm Lisa Friedman. I'm with Climate Wire, and I also have two questions. Um, the, the first is on the, the spike in neutral aid that you talked about, and I was hoping that you, someone could talk a little bit more about that and, and why you think it has been outpacing environmental aid. Um, and secondly, I was, I was curious about U.S. aid and what you found about to which countries we give the most and, and uh, for what, what kinds of projects. I think that's five questions among the three from three. So would uh, folks on the panel like to uh, divide and conquer in addressing those? Sure. Yeah, I can go first on a couple of these. Um, to answer Kathleen, uh, no. 
Well, we did not do any empirical research on the ground. Uh, we didn't sort of take a sample. What, what one might have done is taken a sample of some of the projects that we had coded and then go look in the field and uh, either do direct uh, analysis or use analysis that's done by uh, other researchers or by the donors themselves. I mean, you can imagine what the potential problems are with that. I do think that the that type of research would be quite complementary. I think this book sort of invites that type of research. It says, you, your question is an oh yeah question. You know, you're talking about these commitments. Oh yeah, what did they? What real impact did they really have? And I think that's a great a great point. Um, we did do some analysis. We did take a sample to look at the difference between commitments and disbursements, uh, and that, those vary dramatically uh, across donors. So there are some donors where a relatively large percentage of the commitments that they make, the funds are not dispersed. Uh, in my own work is on tends to be on multilateral development banks, and uh, at least for the sample that we took in the in the 1990s, the uh, the difference in the rate. I mean, it was like something like 85 percent of commitments were dispersed. Uh, but certainly, there's you know, for a range of different ways you could measure that, there are gaps to be filled here. Uh, on the neutral, why does neutral go up? Question. Again, perhaps this is informed by my own research on multilateral development banks, but we. When you look at, I mean, there's some variation, but when you look at the aggregate trends over time, when you lump all donors together, you see some real similarities to what you would see if you just looked at the World Bank group alone. And my sense is that when uh, environmental groups and voters within the West uh, were pushing hard politically on their uh, representatives in the U.S. Congress and in legislatures in, uh, in Western Europe, to a greater degree than in Japan, uh, you got the executive board encouraging the bank to adopt uh, less damaging uh, environmental projects. Um, that's certainly not the whole story. Uh, undoubtedly, there were people working within the bank uh, on the staff, some of them in this room, who also had their own principles, their own environmental principles, and they were working from within. But my impression is that the transitions really come when domestic groups demand their politicians vote in particular ways on these executive boards and you get policies change and you get the distribution of the projects you know, to look different. Uh, so I think our book shows that uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the projects that environmentalists really got upset about and, and could rally around were the dirty projects. And so reducing dirty projects was the clearest way to respond to political pressure rather than increasing environmental projects. When I first started studying this, I never thought about dirty projects. I was only looking to measure environmental aid and expect to see increases in environmental aid. And I'm glad that we looked at all projects across the board and then observed that you know, the dirty projects declining were really, you know, to me, the mo that's the most significant story. I'll take a stab just very quickly on Adam's point about um, making aid more flexible. Where are you? I sort of lost you there. Um, that's, this brings up this whole question of tied aid, and there's been a strong effort across from recipients to push to donors to untie their aid, right, to not make it not conditional on being bought. In the country that's providing the money, for example, having to buy John Deere tractors, um, you know, for American aid or American food aid, and the the issue is a double edge. It's I strongly agree with that, and then it is much more efficient to buy local food and may help local markets and local farmers much more. That should be the case, and especially in emergencies. Yes, that's a no-brainer. On the other hand, in this case of Japan, was quite interesting. In Japan, had a huge increase in environmental aid in the late '90s, uh, and with a big announcement at Rio, as as Brad was talking about. And um, and yet they sort of uh, some of the support for their environmental aid started to erode as they untied their aid. That is, there was um, strong business lobby that was benefiting very strongly from that aid. So if we want large amounts of aid, I think there's there's a double edge on this. And so it's not an easy one. I, I think in general the principle is that we should untie aid, but we should be aware that there's going to be a political you know, the political side that has to be worked on. Um, on Lisa's point about um, climate aid, I work a lot on that. I could, we could go to the last slide that's in the extra slides. There's, um, 
some initial work done by Brendan uh, Wilson was one of our, one of our students. The, um, the very last one. Keep going. One more. There we go. So on um, overtime, this um, one more. No, one back. Oh, one, back one. Yeah, one oh. back. Okay, these are in different order. Okay, so the this top slide shows the number of projects for climate change uh, topics over our period. Is the I know these are tiny, but um, is this um, number that goes up very steeply? And then the second one is the amount of money, this sort of dash line, and then we can see down here anyway roughly that a lot of it's for energy efficiency or the bottom bars, and then some of it's for mitigation, and then it's just a tiny bit for adaptation. So there's been really a quite, it really it was in the late, in the 90s, there's quite a bit more. For example, um, seven, $676 million was given for energy efficiency in the 80s, but it was $4.5 billion during the 90s. Um, energy, um, renewable energies went from $1.5 billion to $2.9 billion, and I think we'd see a lot more in the, in the 2000s. Some of our students are here um, now, that, and I've uh, sent them on a goose chase through the OECD's latest data, um, coding these things um, to try to, f uh, on a new climate change sector codes on different types of uh, mitigation and adaptation aid. We've got a lot more to do on this, but the first indications are that it's not as big as I expected. Uh, that we did just sampling so far, but it's, it's quite small. And I, I don't think there's any doubt that we need a, a new surge in climate change aid. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, there are some very, very interesting thing to do is look at the documents of all the aid agencies. Australian aid has put out a big uh, policy statement about adaptation to climate change, helping their neighbors in the South Pacific, uh, especially island nations that are at risk of rising sea levels, and a new report from USAID about adaptation um, so we're seeing more attention from the donors, and now I think, I, I guess the point that I would make, though, is that we're relying too much on market mechanisms right now with the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, will provide funding for adaptation with its 2% levy on trading of climate change permits, but that's going to take a while to come. It'll probably be too late for some of the needs that are out there right now, especially on mitigation, as uh, Robert Goodwin was saying. and. Um, so we, I think we, need, we still need aid. Aid needs to pay attention to this issue, and it, we cannot just assume that good development means good adaptation to climate change. In some cases, yes, but there is going to be a lot of funding that we need to just to focus on climate change adaptation. That doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of other kinds of development. Yeah, I'd like to just jump in on the question uh, that came about sort of donor specializing and uh, establishing comparative advantage or the, the opposite of that. I think one of the neat things that we have not yet done with the, the database is that uh, because we're, we're gathering this, these data at the project level, you can actually come up with sort of a donor fragmentation index. And I think Steve Knack and some others have already done this, not in the environment sector, but you could go and test. Uh, are, you know, in this particular country, in Ghana, are is the funding centralized and or is it more uh, fragmented and does, is, is that assistance does that tend to be more effective you know we in one of the case studies i think it was the brazil case study we saw that germany was playing a very dominant role and there have been lots of pickups and bumps on the road but uh, we sort of end the case study uh, cautiously optimistic that uh, some things do seem to be uh, moving in the right direction, and there has one one variable there has been the the leadership aspect, and they have been uh, kind of bringing all donors together under one tent, focusing on the same issue. So, I guess just from a, a hy hypothesis uh, st standpoint, I think you know you might you might think that uh, if donors are not highly fragmented that they might be a little bit more effective, but that's, pro that's something that needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was another question about the actual impact to these projects. And I think that you know, there's different levels of analysis that this can take place at. Uh, you know, there's a revolution going on right now in development economics where there's a real move to the micro side of things. And a lot of donors are now funding uh, these sort of randomized clinical trials 
uh, to really isolate the impact of an individual intervention. And we talk about a few cases that are happening in the environment sector on you know, a clean stove project in India. There's uh, one that's been done in the, in the Brazilian Amazon, but there's a lot of work uh, that could be done there to give us a better sense of what works and what doesn't. And then at the same time, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this at the end, uh, but there's, there's work that can be done at the macro level, sort of uh, unbundling aid into its constituent parts. We can really start to do macro level research with this type of database, database to look at, okay, across countries and across time, uh, that's where you can really get better external validity because the, the, this micro revolution is great on internal validity but not so good on external. And so at the, at the, on the macro side of things, you really can start to exploit some of the variation across countries and across time. I think we have lots of hands and not very much time left. So why don't we start over here, and again, we'll collect a bunch, and so I urge you to take notes, because it'll be more than just a few, obviously. Go ahead. And, oh. and those of you asking questions, if you could keep them short, because there are at least 15 hands out there. Go ahead. Oh, okay, my name is Sakara Saunders, and regarding the question of um, donor country motivation, I feel that there's a whole spectra of possible motivations it's a little bit been just not discussed yet and one of those is the privatization of resources and the privatization of pollution you know like carbon credits and things like that and so I was wondering if you came across that in any of your research um, and I don't know also I just wanted to say that given that um, when there's many donors countries working together you, you see an increase in efficacy of aid um, do you find it troubling that the bilateral aid in particular has increased? Thanks very much. Tom Brooks from Conservation International. At the um, Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity a couple of weeks ago, um, Germany announced a significant increase in investment in forest conservation in delivering multiple benefits for highly cost-effective climate change mitigation, um, livelihoods and ecosystem services benefits and biodiversity benefits. Um, given your results here, what potential do you see for encouraging the rest of the world's governments to follow that kind of lead? Terrific. Tom, if you could hand that right behind you. There you go. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Jane Pratt. Uh, I would love to hear more about the PLAD database itself. Um, does the book have a detailed description of how the database is structured, what parameters and variables are included, and most important, how other researchers can get their hands on it? <laughs> terrific, terrific. If we go two rows back, the lady in green, and then we'll move up to the side. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Susanna Dennis from Population Action International. And I've done a similar project on a much smaller scale, looking at potential gender impacts of World Bank and other MDB projects. So I highly commend you. And I've dealt with some coding problems, <laughs> et cetera. But I'd like to comment that it's possible that the increase in neutral projects is because of an increased focus on health and social sector projects, which I noticed you coded as neutral. Um, and if you could talk about that coding a little bit more. Um, also, I'd like to see a similar project done specifically on poverty impacts. So which kinds of projects would be negative or positive? Just an idea for future research. Um, and then lastly, we see an increased focus on general budget support, um, focus on using country systems sector-wide projects and even like development support credits, development policy lending is very broad. And I'm wondering where you coded a project, let's say a, a, a sector-wide project that would have one potentially positive environmental impact and then one negative impact. Or were there any projects that you couldn't code at all? Thank you. Karen, while you give it to Brian, I'm going to add one of my own, which is um, this notion of the, of the neutral project and uh, the challenge anyway, or perhaps you have a way to, to address it, but the challenge it seems to me when, in, when I saw disaster, for example, and thought of the tsunami and thought of the home building and that kind of rescue response 
and what really, in a number of cases, particularly destructive, accelerated deforestation effect that had, mm -hmm. um, and that there were ways to do that, the ways that that was done very well, and ways that it was not done so well vis-a-vis -vis the environment, and how that kind of, how to capture that if that's possible. So, Brian? Thanks, Jeff. Um, my name is Brian Greenberg, and I'm with Winrock International, and I wanted to thank you for all of the hard work um, in putting the book together, and um, Dr. Goodland for your candid reflections on trends in World Bank funding. Um, if I take as your sort of joint conclusion that greening has been limited uh, now maybe to 10 percent of funding from a low base, um, that there is a lot of potential greenwashing that needs to be scrubbed out of the coding systems and that are used by the donors to, um, to represent their programs that aren't accurate. The issue I'd like to raise, though, is one of real context here. And it has to do with the fact that in a globalizing, uh, in more increasingly integrated and um, a world that's <laughs> open to foreign direct investment, overseas development assistance as a portion of economies and of total investments in countries is very small and has been falling in many places. And that's one of the realities that the World Bank discovered in terms of its loans and its agreements with other countries that they have essentially been swamped by <laughs> corporatization of international investment, remittance flows, and so forth. And in effect, what's happening is that to the extent that we focus on the greenness of de overseas development assistance and, and those projects, it's a bit like, and if you'll allow me some imagery here, it's a bit like a bird which represents overseas development assistance perched on top of the rhinoceros, which represents the global economy. And as the global economy has been moving faster and faster through ecosystems and across landscapes, the bird struggles to hold on. And the major phenomenon at work here is not whether, on balance, the bird is picking more bugs off the rhinoceros than it's grabbing off the undergrowth and dropping onto the rhinoceros as it goes by. But really, in terms of the goals that we would hope for development assistance, which would be something like putting a steering wheel and brakes on the rhinoceros. And I'd submit to you that's the real task, the policy task of stabilizing global economies, making the vast bulk of economic activity more sustainable. And to the extent that we focus inwardly, we really tend to diminish our sense of the important of what, importance of what's going out in, on out in the macro economies. Thanks for letting me go on there. Okay, why don't we capture right there, out in the corner, Sonia, and just a couple more, and then we'll have to leave the remaining time for you to have the daunting challenge of trying to answer all these questions. Hi, Jill Blockus with the Nature Conservancy. Um, like Manish, I'm very excited about the this research and the fact that the database will soon be updated and out. Um, I I have a lot of comments and suggestions if, if that is made available in future. I can talk to you about this afterwards. But um, just one question and one small point. Um, you threw out a teaser when you were talking about the DFID claim where they said it was 25 percent environmental and with your measures you came down to 10 percent. So if you could just give a few snippets of what, what actually changed, why your measures brought it down to 10 percent um, as an illustrative, that would be quite helpful. Um, then I like Manish and, and Robert um, did spend some time at the World Bank and worked on environment and, and grant schemes there and um, feel like it's a bit of a schizophrenic organization because there are some, as Dr. Goodland pointed out, there are a number of, of issues that come out that are glaring mistakes and, and yet there are some positive trajectories and initiatives and um, just in the past six months, there's been put forward at, at the behest pretty much of the UK government with the US and, and Japan funding, um, the climate investment funds, and also under that, the clean tech funds, which would go to middle income countries. So there are a number of things, particularly with Zulik now as head of the World Bank, as opposed to the Wolfowitz appointment, um, a, a good deal of environmental footing has, has got back on. There's a bit more balance between the infrastructure 
but again, it's a struggling institution and, and, and how it can move forward on, on climate. Be interested to hear your comments on following those trends. Okay, terrific. I see two, John and the lady in the middle, and if they can both be quick and then we'll give you. This is not a question, it's a plea. Take your 10 lessons, which I gather from Robert are uh, excellent, uh, and a summary of the findings and put in a short piece of paper you can give it to policymakers. Yes, so form matters, great. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Srabani Roy, I'm with the Bank Information Center, nothing to do with the World Bank. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, related to Jill's question, on paper these climate investment funds look great but they continue to fund dirty coal. Um, so how did you, I mean, I know it, your research doesn't go up to today's date, but how do you specifically look at projects like, on paper, they look great for climate change, they're environmental, but in reality, obviously, they're not. And the other clarification I wanted to ask is, in your neutral category, you included, I believe you included agriculture. Um, and I'm curious what your logic and thinking was, because some would say, Agriculture could be anything but neutral. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to try to summarize all that. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first, and I'll be, I'll be as, quickly, as quick as I can. Uh, for, we can't possibly answer all these questions. They're great questions, and the, the ones that interest me most are the nitty-gritty coding questions that you know the social scientists in the room are clearly asking. And all I can do is inc I encourage you to email us. I'd be happy to correspond with you, and we do have opportunities uh, as we're rolling the database out. We need guinea pigs to beat on the database and make bad things happen to it to try to fix it. Uh, so we have, you know, we have plans for that, so we want to talk to you. Uh, a couple comments very briefly. First of all, I think the most important thing that's said in the room today was said by the man in the blue shirt, the rhinoceros man. What's your name? <laughs> Brian, I, I, I did not disagree with anything you said. Um, uh, you know, we, and we're quite clear about that in the book, that we're not explaining uh, we're not talking about whether developing countries are greening. We're talking about whether development aid is greening. And it's perfectly reasonable for someone to say, you're not asking the right research question. You really ought to be studying rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, rather than birds. I, I think that's entirely plausible. The two things I would say, just very briefly, are uh, citizens should care about how their taxpayers' dollars are spent. That's what they have control over. It, you know, that's the kind of accountability mechanisms we have in democracies. So we ought to care about how our government spends our money. This is the official uh, money flowing from taxpayers directly or indirectly from, from democracies. Uh, second, these are, we did use these cases as opportunities to test uh, hypotheses from uh, theories of international politics and development that, that we care about, uh, you know, buried or buried high up in the, in the ivory tower. So I take your points, though I think they're great. Um, very briefly, Ms. on Ms. Saunders' point, uh, bilateral versus multilateral aid. Yeah, I was really surprised too. Uh, you know, the, the hunch within the, the international relations, the IPE literature that I work in, is that multilateral assistance will be more effective than bilateral assistance for lots of good theoretical reasons. But our data showed that bilateral donors greened more quickly and they targeted countries that we expect will be more effective at implementing uh, their projects. Uh, one possible answer t as to why this is uh, might focus on the fact that in many multilateral aid organizations, UN organizations and MDBs, recipient countries have votes. So bilateral donor, you know, when the United States gives money, mostly the government has to respond to voters in the U.S., which are, you know, much more environmentally oriented than those constituents or those governments in uh, the parts of the developing world. Uh, and so this was not something that I was prepared for. It was a surprise. I think there are a variety of different explanations. Um, Joan, uh, J Jane Pratt and, and other people asked about coding. I'd lo love to have a much longer discussion about this, but let me just say one brief thing. I love the question about multi-sector projects. Those increased dramatically in proportion in, as the time series went on, and now there are more. So between 2000 and 2006, there are even more multi-sector than there were in the stuff we covered. Uh, in, a, in the Plaid 2.0 and what we're doing this summer, and this is really being led by our, our colleagues, our, by our partners at Brigham Young University. They started doing a much more sophisticated version of this coding. Uh, instead of assigning a single code to a single project, which is what we did, we said, on average, what's the biggest impact? You know, 50% or more, it gets coded as X. 
they are they have multiple codes for every project if they're multi-sector and i think this will allow more fine-grained analysis ours was a was a first cut it's a great question there's lots of different ways to do that and we, we've got one way um anyway i yeah i'll just stop <laughs> sorry i'll jump in uh there was a question about diffid uh and how they came up with this 25 percent number uh, that 25 percent of their total foreign aid portfolio was dedicated to environment projects. Uh, when we went and looked at this, it turned out that they were assigning an environment code to all of the agriculture projects, all of the forestry projects, and all of the energy efficiency projects. And so, uh, you know, we went through there, and just like we showed you, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, when you open up forestry, there really is everything from, you know, clear cutting to sustainable forestry, and so I think, uh, and and likewise in agriculture, uh, and we do uh, generally code agriculture in the dirty sector. I, I don't recall if, if we do dirty broadly defined or dirty strictly defined. Remember. So once we went through and recoded all those projects that Diffid was calling environmental in ag, forestry energy efficiency, uh, then that led to a different number. And I think this really gets to a, a huge issue that is of interest to a very, very broad audience uh, in Western countries. And that is, uh, we hear these promises over and over about uh, commitment to spend more on the environment. You know, we, we go back and talk about Stockholm, 1972, and then we look at some of the some of the commitments that were made then to invest more in environmentally friendly projects. And they sound very, very familiar to what we then saw at Rio and then what we saw uh, at Joburg and Glen Eagles. It's almost an exact repetition of the same promises. And so I think one of the very practical uses of this type of research is there needs to be some degree of accountability to figure out if they, if Japan says they are going to spend two billion dollars on the environment at, at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. Somebody should be out there figuring out if they actually did that and if those projects are greenwashed or if we really think they have a credible chance of uh, having a positive impact on the environment. I'll turn it over to you. Well, this is just a quick response to Tom Brooks from Conservation International talking about Germany's pro uh, promise uh, and this attention to e paying developing countries for ecosystem services that they're preserving. I think that's got to be an important part of our addressing climate change in the future. If we want people to not cut down the rainforest, we've got to make it so that they can afford to live a decent life. So we're going to have to pay them. That's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, two points. Um, uh, I fully agree with Brown Greenberg. The priority is certainly to add a steering wheel and brakes to the rhinoceros. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the accountability hasn't reached strategy and policy formulation. The bank group's I, uh, Amazon policy is a year old, and no one's ever seen it outside the bank. That's where accountability has to be extended to. That's a, the sort of brake and steering wheel to the rhinoceros. The World Bank's contribution is relatively small. It's getting smaller, some would say good thing. But it's very highly leveraged, so you would expect, I would expect, that the World Bank should raise standards and, and put laudable goals and then try and drag the rest of aid up to the high standards. It's doing the opposite. It's doing lowest co common denominator. It's financing what everyone else is financing, logging, deforestation, and, and, and uh, coal. Um, the, other, the other point, this is an uh, academic pa panel, so I don't feel embarrassed by asking the rather academic question about uh, efficiency and Jevons' paradox. I understand from my dear friend Herman Daly that the Jevons paradox says that efficiency, increased efficiency, lowers the cost of the product. And so if you lower the cost, it would tend to increase consumption. So efficient electricity generation, for example, is cheaper than inefficient production. So you, you, you tend to use more. So when you're coding efficiency, you may want to look into Jevons paradox. And some may be good. Some may be really awful. Thank you. 
Terrific, Robert. Well, thank you. It's um, a very rich set of questions and obviously a rich set of presentations. Um, I, I do think we're going to hear a lot more about this book and this data set. Um, I urge you to contact the authors at the, at the uh, email that's up on the screen. That's the website, yeah. Oh, thank that's you. That's just our website. And, and uh, as well as come to the, to the Wilson Center website for a summary and the slides and uh, contact some ways that you can get to, to the authors and the arguments that are made and discussed today. So again, thanking World Resources Institute and Manish for coming uh, and our authors. Please join me in thanking them for today's rich discussion.